uh, welcome everyone uh, to the session can dictator uh, enhance agility by radesh radhakrishnan a short introduction about uh, radesh that he works as a head of engineering uh, in the hospitality at ibs software private limited uh, we thank radesh for his availability today and without any further delay uh, i'll i'll pass it over to you uh, over to you radesh thank you kartik uh, hello dear uh, agile enthusiasts um, um, so as kartik said just a uh, quick intro about myself uh, i uh, started as a software engineer uh, like uh, around two, two decades ago and i worked to different roles um, right in mostly in the software product engineering space right now i'm heading the engineering for uh, the hospitality line of business at ibs uh, ibs is uh, celebrating uh, 25 years of its inception and uh, it's really a proud moment for me uh, you know to talk to you this evening and for all the leaders and agile enthusiasts right listening in today uh, we all know that uh, while agile makes sense for most of us uh, if you don't pay really close attention to right um, continuously enhancing agility it can sometimes have like you know some uh, uh, side effects or can and then also backfire on us uh, so and also uh, specifically like you know with agile we cannot expect that everything will go smooth right we can also get get into the times of crisis in those kind of situations what kind of uh, leader, leadership style uh, will you use right so i am going to really be focusing on uh, some of those areas uh, today um i'm sure you also have heard of things like peace time ceos what time ceos etc so let's go and find out okay so the question uh, can dictate dictate is really enhance ability um if you are looking for a quick cancer a yes or no answer uh, i'm sorry i don't uh, i have a bad news for you uh we will not have that answer right away but no problem uh we will come back to this question right and then we will sit uh, together later uh for now let me walk you through a uh, a real story uh, that really happened so uh, and also i'm sure like many of you as leaders of uh, software engineering uh, should find it very easy to relate to um so ready to listen to a story okay once upon a time right not too long ago uh, there was this engineering team that was tasked uh, with a mission to build a top class software product uh, team was extremely talented uh, with very high level of uh, bonding also uh, that typically all of our software engineering agile teams that we look forward to and that they kind of go any far to support each other uh the captain of the team definitely was one of the best servant leaders that you could ever find um really a true blend of uh, product expertise technical expertise and the team identified uh really the best uh, tech stack to build their uh, software product on and of course they followed agile methodology and uh you know with, with the very popular of uh, two weeks uh, sprint model everything was just perfect uh, team was growing very nicely towards their end goals and things like that now uh, the story goes into the some uh, distant turns right uh, so typically you see the movie stories how things go uh, as it goes uh, in one of the sprint retros or product on this saying hey look uh, we are slipping on stories our go live dates are uh, shifting um qa manager is sitting next to him and says uh, hey we are seeing a lot more bugs now um uh, and really we are kind of getting blocked as well um it's also so frustrating uh, to switch context so which is where the developers are coming in and saying uh, and everyone is looking at the scrum master uh, hopefully but she says god look too many blockers uh, how many blockers do we have really i don't even know what to do with most of them um long cycle times uh, merge hell uh, you know releasing is really really getting harder right uh, so the team leader was really listening very patiently and he said uh, i get it right so let me talk to the management and see if we can get some help um 
So he goes to the management, management looks at all the data, and uh, of course, they're not convinced. Uh, and the question is, why are you slipping? Like we as uh, leaders, right? That's a normal response, especially when our team comes and tells us the same story. Um, and we'll tell them, of, of course, you know, come back and, uh, you know, share a fixed plan uh, to bring the project back on track. Uh, we cannot miss the sales guidelines. We cannot miss the, the, the revenue numbers. So our team leader goes back to the team and asks for help. Uh, it's a very closely knit team, right? So they really care for each other. So they decide after a lot of thinking that uh, uh, that we will work, uh, we, we need to figure it, figure out a solution, right? So they're saying, okay, let's work harder. Um, we will, doesn't matter, extra hours, long weekends, doesn't matter. We will fix it. And the leader goes back to the management, um, delivers the promise that uh, they will work really hard to bring things back on track. <clears throat> now, um, you know what will happen, right? Uh, in a typical situation, if you worked in the software industry for so long, you know how many times uh, do we really see things uh, coming back on track, right? It's it's really, really hard. Uh, and many of you might have also read the book like Phoenix Project and uh, how things can go from uh, bad to worse and, you know, uh, deep red and things like that. So, um, same happens here. Long hours, uh, sleepless nights uh, becomes a norm. Some people get sick. Work-life balance uh, is impacted. Quality goes worse day by day. Release dates are slipping. Software is not scaling. Management is losing patience. It's kind of like a big pressure cooker building now. And of course, one fine day, uh, the best engineers decides that's enough. Now he gets and uh, the the load comes to the next set of people they are they are stretching even further uh, finally people are leaving one by one the leader is also feeling the feeling a lot of pressure on from both sides and he also decides to give product is just halfway through operational costs are very very high um, and all the dates are in forecast everything is gone for us now the auditors board investors everybody is trying to question you know, do we really continue with this project or not? Uh, does this sound fa very familiar to many of you? Um, how many times have you seen this, right, as software leaders? Um, and I can tell you, uh, this is, uh, in, in, in such scenarios, you're really not alone. Uh, there are several uh, first-hand experience that I had, and also I'm sure most of you had, with similar stories. Um, same plot, uh, maybe the squads change, maybe the products or projects change, companies or engineers change, but really the same thing. Uh, so as uh, true agile practitioners, let's see what really happened here. Um, you know, let's do the typical introspection, right? Uh, first, maybe let's look at all the positives, like what went well. Uh, so with the retro sessions, right? Uh, one thing was the team really knew what was happening. Uh, they they saw the warning signs, they saw the problems, and they were really uh, surfacing it. They were telling to the management, uh, to their leader, and then leader is going back to the management and telling the story and all that. Uh, all that is good. Now, what was wrong here? Really, what went, What was not right? Uh, the only thing was they just decided to work hard, right? Uh, is working hard really the solution to all these problems, right? So that's really the, the biggest question that we need to answer. Okay, so let's see um, what was happening in this case, right? Maybe if you do a deep dive um, as a leader, uh, you'll see that you know if there were really warning signs, uh, too many bugs, quality issues, etc. Um, your developers were under, are, were under real tremendous pressure, and they wanted to finish their work faster. Uh, but they were uh, the merging things, changing things too fast, etc. And uh, what about our QA folks? Too many changes coming their way. Uh, are they are really overwhelmed, right? Can they test release that fast? Our product owner is really losing patience. Uh, the story is not ready. He's, he cannot accept things. 
uh, and the releases are altered, you know, sales timelines, flipping all those issues, right? Uh, so if we, we all leaders, right, know that if we continue to work the way we do uh, and expect different results, you know, we know what to call that it's syndrome, right? So in the rest of the session, what, what we'll do is we'll look at some of the fixes, right? Very simple fixes, uh, common fixes, but very effective leadership interventions, right? That you can apply when you get into such situations. So the first problem, uh, right? What, what we just saw about the quality gates issue. How do we, um, as a leader, right, uh, fix this problem? Uh, so if you ask any leader, how do you solve this problem? You'll get an immediate answer. Let's prevent the bugs. Um, how? Uh, the preventing bugs is just a philosophy, right? How do we put that philosophy really into action? Uh, so let me make a statement here. Bugs are created because developers did not know their code, had quality issues, right? When merged, right? It's not intentional. Uh, we need to, let's trust the developers, please. Okay, so uh, can we help developers to know the quality issues uh, before they merge and fix them before they become bugs? Right. So we all know that the automated unit tests from XP days, and for a lot of time now, uh, we have the build tools with quality gate checks, static code analyzers, static vulnerability analyzers for images, etc. And we don't allow merges, right? When these checks fail, do we? Uh, however, when the chaos sets in, right? We have the timeline pressures, cost pressures. That's when teams really fall back into bad practices. And what do they do, right? They, it's not intentional, but they try to see how to fast track things. The first thing they do is right, go and bypass the quality checks. Um, and that's really where things go, starts to go really worse, right? Uh, so that when the quality drops, we get into that uh, spiral drop of uh, loop of never ending problems. So what should we do as a leader? right um, in this case uh, what can be an effective leadership intervention uh, so and, and this is a very simple thing right what i'm going to tell you and you can almost always apply this uh, and this is praised and practice for years uh, just don't tell the team right uh, you know go see it yourself so we can actually look at the uh, the quality bars how do we raise the quality bar right so instead of just telling the team hey go raise the quality bar why don't you just take a closer look? Look at your build system. Uh, how is it configured? When was the last time you checked the build system? Right? Uh, are they really operational? Are they really working? Uh, is the quality if the quality bar is not met, is the gates blocking the changes from being merged? Uh, if if so, that's good, right? Now ask uh, one thing: uh, Is that quality bar enough? Do we need to raise the bar? Are we missing some checks? Um, should be some add some more. Uh, maybe the last merge had, uh, you know, say 90 plus percentage test coverage for new lines of code. Great. Uh, but are they effective in catching quality issues? When was the last time you reviewed unit tests? Developer may have created, uh, right, some of them with the right intentions. But uh, have they checked the effectiveness of unit tests? How do we check the effectiveness uh, of unit tests? Is there any uh, techniques that you have applied so far? Um, and there are good things, right? As the, the latest tools that are emerging, things like mutation testing, for example, is a very effective mechanism that you can add in to improve the effectiveness of your unit testing, for example. Um, or you can add multiple levels of code reviews. Um, so th th there are tools that are available for us and we could use them. So that's probably the first um, intervention that you can do as a leader to uh, improve your quality gates, reinforce them. Okay. So let's look at the next item. <clears throat> and and, and, and I'm, I'm just giving you a couple of examples, right, as uh, good leadership inter interventions. And we look at some of the other things later. So we, of course, as software people, we don't love bugs, right? Um, but, uh, because the moment we, a bug enters the system, we know that it takes away all our precious time. Triage, prioritizing, grooming, planning for next iteration, setting up the environment, reproducing the problem, finding the root cause, finding the fix, 
And then does it uh, impact the existing uh, design? If so, if not good, of course, then implement the fix, test it, run it through the test cycle again. It goes to the QA backlog, then again to their work queue. Uh, they need to understand the work, validate the test cases, readjust, retest, and if it's not make, breaking any things, then merge it, right? Fix this demo. Uh, if everything is aligning well or all the stars are looking good, then we can go to the release procedure. Right? If, if something fails, uh, start all over again. Uh, but if you add all of this time, right, and see that it's really uh, you know taking away a lot of uh, you know your precious engineering time and effort, right, on this thing. Uh, you know, really the time of all of our software engineering life spent messing up with bugs. Uh, and if as engineers, the best wish that we can ask our God is like, oh God, uh, can I uh, relive my software engineering life in a world there are no bugs, right? Um, and of course, uh, can we create a bug-free world? Uh, interestingly, it was probably not possible before, uh, but today it is possible, right? Uh, and the trick is to basically get it right the first time. Let's see how. Um, so, Radesh, uh, time check for you. Okay, thank you. So, um, let's see this uh, example. In this case, we have the. Uh, let's first thank the advances right in the software engineering. Uh, for the first time in the history of software engineering, it's now possible for us to imagine a bug free world. Um, so how do we do that? We have uh, the concepts that you probably heard of, uh, like shift club testing. Uh, maybe it's new for you. Maybe some of you are already doing it. Uh, but let's see what it is. Right? It's a it's a very simple technique. Um, what we are doing is we are just moving the cream of our automated tests uh, from executing post uh, to executing pre Um, And for that, uh, for, why why would we do that? Right. Uh, so before we do, we need a good test strategy. Uh, the strategy that your automation tests are catching most of the problems pre months. Uh, and we already know and talked about static code analysis, you know, code review quality gates and all that. They are catching the quality issues um, automatically pre months, right? Um, and we also talked about unit test coverage uh, and the effectiveness of catching the issues at the functional level. Right. Um, so uh, we talked about mutation testing framework. Uh, now, do you have APIs in your software? Many of these new age products do, right? And most likely you also have automated them. But uh, where are they running? Like where is your API automation test running? Is it happening pre merge Is it happening post merge So a very simple technique is to bring them pre merge and execute them pre merge So if you do that, uh, we can actually prevent the uh, the the code, the problematic code being merged, and then finding the defects, and then the defects entering the system. So this is a very effective, uh, simple technique. The next technique, uh, we have the, of course, all of us have the critical user journeys, right, that we identify. Um, are they automated? And if they are automated, when are they executed? Are they executed uh, post-merge? Uh, if so, why don't you just uh, shift it and execute pre-merge? And if, if and only if they pass, uh, let the code uh, be merged, right? Allow it to be merged. And again, by doing that, we can actually prevent a whole set of bugs being, uh, from being entering the system. Uh, there are a couple of things to watch out for. We should ensure that the COG execution time is not too high. Uh, and if it is too high, right, your developers might not really like it. And also, there are a few anti patterns that you might watch out for. Um, things like, you know, automating everything that is a typical and pattern if you do that you can always uh, get get into some issues um, again uh, you know the another typical anti pattern is like you know executing all automated tests pre much uh, which can also be a problem because you will again see that your uh, the, the execution time is very high uh, there are a couple of techniques that you can apply here um, for example like you know if you know that only one class has changed you could basically just test, uh, run the unit test for only that class, right? You don't need to really run all the unit tests. Or if your one API changed, or you know there is a, there is a change only in one functional area, 
you don't need to execute all the CUJs. You probably can just execute the CUJ automated test only in that functional area, right? So this way, actually, you can uh, speed up your uh, uh, execution time uh, by by computing the uh, blast radius or you know impact radius or whatever you want to call it. Now uh, there is one more thing, right? So when you do all these things, we also want to change the way we are uh, rewarding our uh, uh, people. So for example, if you are rewarding your um, engineers for generating more works, you may want to rethink that strategy. Maybe instead of doing that, just uh, change it such that you uh, ask them to prevent works instead of generating more works. And how do we do that? Uh, you can actually change the OKRs to something like, you know, say zero critical bugs reported or uh, flakiness percentage of the automated test should be zero or all, all CUJs and APA tests should be automated or the elapsed time to find the offending, uh, the offending code uh, for a build failure is near, is near zero, things like that, right? So there are a few more examples. I might uh, skip them in the interest of time. But let's now finally, uh, you know, just get into a uh, quickly summarize right what we learned and see how can we put this into practice. Uh, so uh, one thing is, uh, you know, uh, we, we talked about the the typical solutions right uh, that are uh, followed by the successful teams. But uh, based on the stage of your agile maturity, or where you stand on the adoption curve of uh, these latest software engineering practices. Uh, your inter interventions might vary, right? If you're still catching up with these latest trends like DevOps, uh, DevSucks, Ops, FML environments, and things like that, shift left testing, etc., uh, your interventions might be a lot more simpler or basic. Or if you're already doing many of that, your interventions can be a more, lot more advanced, right? And then some of the examples we looked at today. So the examples I was sharing was very um, generic common things. Um, and, and also we saw this, saw them in bits and pieces, right? So in just quickly on th in 30 seconds, I can tell you how to put this into practice. It's a very uh, simple technique. Uh, you can use this DPSR technique. The most important thing is you should ensure that you document all of them, right? So all the decisions that you made, ensure that that's documented because especially in these times, right? Most of us are working in remote, um, uh, remote mode, right? So doc documentation is very important. Uh, once you have that, you can actually take it and pilot it with uh, on some of your, um, uh, you know, maybe one or two squads. And if you see that uh, they are, um, you know, they are having issues, you can revise them, refine them. And then finally, you could basically roll it out to uh, everybody else. And once you do that, you need to figure out how to sustain them. So the nicest thing about all these latest tools and technology is that we can automate a lot of these. We can automate the quality gate checks. Uh, we can automate most of this, uh, what we just talked about. And finally, we talked about reward schemes. You may want to change your OKRs. You may want to change your um, you know, reward schemes such that uh, you're rewarding the right behavior. Okay. So with that, um, I think we already said uh, the, the just a quick summary of the takeaways. Um, as leaders, right, uh, make sure that you're actually trying to uh, intervene at the right time. Um, and do, do the right things right for the team. Show them the way. They are actually really looking forward to you. Uh, you have to really deep dive, understand the problem, and find the technical fixes, and uh, use these techniques, like you know, the simple DPSR techniques to um, you know, roll out uh, the right interventions. And if you are a team member, you could also help by being a change agent and support the implementation. So that's it. Um, we'll stop now. Any questions? So yeah, thank you so much everyone for attending this session. And we thank Radesh for sharing his experience with us today.